With cases on the rise again in Michigan, the governor extends her emergency order while the arguments rage over everything from schools to wearing a mask. We'll talk about it with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And ready or not, there's a primary election on the horizon. Are we ready or not? Today is Sunday, July 19, 2020, and this is Flashpoint. Hi there, welcome to Flashpoint. I hope you're well this morning. I have not really needed my calendar much lately. They're really aren't too many appointments for me to keep. No dinners with friends to keep track of. But I did happen to look at my calendar last week and I realized that I was supposed to be in Milwaukee covering the Democratic National Convention. And then this coming Friday, we were supposed to be watching the opening ceremonies from Tokyo for the Summer Olympic Games. Nope and nope. The pandemic keeps churning and rather than settling down for the summer right now, it's surging. Governor Whitmer is worried, extending her emergency order, even as there are several attempts to shut down her emergency powers. A ton of weight hangs on most every decision she makes right now, few as heavy as the decision on the start of the school year. Governor Whitmer is my guest today, and she'll join us here in just a moment. A little later on, we're also going to talk politics today. The primary election is just a little more than a week away, and it's gotten scarce little attention. We'll turn our attention to it coming up today on Flashpoint. I can't think of a time when the nation's governors have been under such intense focus. It's been the case in so many states, and that certainly includes our own. Very good to have with us again back on Flashpoint, Governor Whitmer joining us via Zoom. Governor, good to have you back on the program uh, that you know so well and have been a part of, or a part of for so long, uh, but obviously now under very uh, trying circumstances. You said this past week that we were arriving at a turning point. I'm wondering if you know where the breaking point becomes. Is there a number you're looking looking for a percentage increase? Is there a moment where you say we now have to start moving backwards? Yeah, so we're watching all sorts of numbers. We have seen our testing capacity dramatically increase. We're doing about 21,000 tests a day. We're watching our positivity of those tests, though, increase as well. And that's the concerning thing. We see that in all regions of the state. So this is not something that is unique to one part of the state or another. This is what we're seeing all across Michigan. The thing about telling you precisely at, at what point we turn the dial is, you know, it's, it's about increase, right? So seven days, 14 days of sustained increase, how big those increases are, but also the context matters. So if we see 140 cases in Wayne County, for instance, but we have a nexus, they all came out of one house party or they all came out of one facility, then we can trace and isolate. But if those 140 cases have no nexus, that they are just randomized, that means that there's community spread. And so the context really matters. The, the numbers, of course, are important. And that's what, you know, it raises all the questions. And that's where the local public health does the important work of tracing. But um, without that context, we can't tell you for sure if it's community spread or if there's a nexus. And it, they're very different situations. If, if there's community spread, that is alarming, and that's when we when we look to perhaps taking a step back. As we're watching some of these numbers jump, we are also watching people trying to make some very definitive plans for the school year, including we just found out, of course, the uh, high school association saying that they're planning to go ahead with the full fall sports schedule for high schools. I'm wondering if that decision squares with you, given what you're watching happen. Well, I think right now we know the word we're all going to have to embrace is nimble. Uh, the fact of the matter is our fortunes can change very quickly when it comes to COVID-19. This virus is still very present. It is still very contagious. It is still deadly. What we see happening in Florida could be Michigan if we all drop our guard. And that's why doubling down on masking up right now is important. Our actions today are going to tell us where we are in 55 days when our kids are supposed to be getting back into class. The first 55 days of COVID-19 in Michigan, we went from zero cases to over 40,000. We had lost 4,000 people in that period of time. Yeah. And so between now and, and Labor Day, we can you know, watch things grow exponentially and quickly rival Florida, which is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe for their economy, for their health care. Their health care systems are under stress. Some of them may, may buckle because of this. Or 
we can do what we did before, which is push this curve down, get our arms around it and lead the nation and get our kids back in school. And that's why masking up um, is one of the most important, simple acts each of us can take in hopes of getting our kids back in class and keeping our economy humming. Uh, you've, of course, got a, a very, a lot of uh, bitterness on the other side. People were upset that you were right now, they believe right now you're wielding too much unilateral power. Unlock Michigan, the campaign is uh, trying a couple of different angles uh, uh, t toward getting more consent, more, forcing you to create more consensus in what you're doing. I have a feeling that the Gretchen Whitmer, who was the minority Senate leader, would have been wanted to be more included in, in the plans that a governor was making and might have been more in favor of the 1976 law, which demands that you go to the legislature to convince them that it's an emergency rather than the 1945 law under which you've been abiding thus far. So the fact of the matter is none of us has seen anything like this in our lifetimes. True enough. This is a 100 year pandemic that has ravaged our country. You know, this is something unlike anything any of us could have imagined. These are powers I've never wanted to use, and I certainly don't relish using them now. Each decision I make weighs heavily on me. One of the things that I know in talking to my fellow governors on both sides of the aisle is we're all dealing with some version of the same kind of pressure, and we're all navigating it to the best of our abilities, and every one of us would just as soon never have to use any of these powers. But the fact of the matter is, with a virus that has grown this quickly, that has taken this many lives, it's incumbent on the nation's governors to step up and lead where there is a vacuum of leadership in Washington, D.C. Whether it is Larry Hogan, the Republican in Maryland, or me here in, in Michigan, or my neighbor to the South, Mike DeWine, Republican in Ohio, every one of us are doing what we can to save lives. And in, in doing that, we shorten the amount of time and the pain economically that we confront as states. This is a time where we've had to move quickly, make decisions based on the best science we have access to. Because this is a virus for which there is still not a vaccine or a cure. This is a virus that can get out of control real quick. And if anyone's paying attention to what's going on in, in Florida, um, they've got people that are saying their governor didn't use powers that he should have and people are dying yeah. because yeah. of it. I'd much rather be in the position we are in in Michigan right now. Well, I want to get the, 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 this personal freedom battle that you're hearing so many people saying that boils down to things like the mask. What are you going to do as we now arrive at the primary and then looking ahead even to November if people want to show up at the polling place without a mask on? Well, we're going to have to make sure that people have the ability to vote. That is absolutely critical. Um, we're going to hope that people do so from home. You get your absentee ballot. You can go online, fill out the application online. You can check it for uh, August and for November. And, and as soon as you get it, fill it out and send it right back in. Don't wait. But for those who show up in person, we want to keep them safe. And so recognizing the social distancing, asking that they mask up, um, ensuring that there is ample hand sanitizer available. We can do this. We can do this safely. But we always know that the safest place to be is at home. So vote from home is my strong encouragement to all of your all of your viewers. Uh, we know that the virus is now spreading a lot among young people, but we also know that the lion's share of the deaths have come among the elderly. And for a while there, uh, a huge chunk of those were people in nursing homes. I'm wondering if now that you've had a little bit of time to look in the rearview mirror, if you have uh, reconsidered or rethought the approach to putting patients with COVID into nursing homes. The uh, comparison that I used with Dr. Caldoun a few weeks ago was this is a little bit like uh, putting boa constrictors in the nursery with the babies because you didn't quite know what to do with them for a while. It was it seemed like the last place on the earth that you uh, that you would want to introduce COVID was nursing homes. Was that the right decision? So we never mandated that any nursing home take COVID patients. What we did do was say if they are returning residents to nursing homes, residents who had COVID, that they had to isolate them and build up a separate facility for them. And that was precisely what the CDC recommended. You know, if with if the novel virus, you go to the expertise and the expertise is the CDC. So every step we took was informed by what they were saying was the best practice at the time. But at no point in time did we ever require 
require any nursing home to take a COVID patient back if they didn't have, if they didn't believe that they were able to do so in a safe manner. This is, uh, you know, one of the challenges of a novel virus. It, it's it's been hard. I mean, the it, it is a tragedy. Anyone, any death from COVID nineteen, and yet we know that our experience is nowhere near as bad as a, a lot of other states. And and so we are always going to move swiftly, make decisions based on the best medical information that we have, and do everything we can to keep people safe. Lastly, Governor, my last question, because I know you've got to get to another call. Um, the as you and I are having this conversation, you've just announced a strengthening of your mask mandate. You want to explain what that is about and how you expect people to proceed with this new directive? Sure. So right now, of course, we are at a turning point. Our numbers in the next 55 days could heat up and make us just like Florida, which is a catastrophe. A lot of people are going to die. Um, I mean, the economy is going to be just absolutely busted in the state of Florida. Or we can do what we did before and mask up and push these numbers down and do so in a way that makes us the envy of 49 other states where our kids can get back in school. At this juncture, the trajectory that we're on is very concerning. It is more um, of the nature of, of seeing community spread, and that's why we've got to mask up now for the sake of our economy, but most importantly, for the sake of the health of our people and the ability to get our kids back in school safely and our education workforce, keeping them safe as well. But you felt so, this needed a sharpening then uh, or, or a little fiercer uh, maybe uh, mandate on it? Yeah, absolutely. We got to tighten up. We have to tighten up. We know what works. If every one of us does it, we're all going to be successful at a nurse to all of our benefit. And so right now was the time to tighten up so we don't have to move backward. We may ultimately have to, but let's get our guard back up. I think spotty compliance has been what's contributing to our increases number, increasing numbers. So let's tighten up now and, and try to get this going in the right direction again. Vital that we get it underhand. Governor, thank you so much for the time. Great to have you back on Flashpoint and we look forward to seeing you again. Absolutely. Thanks, Devin. You bet. We'll continue with more. We'll start turning our focus to the Michigan primary, now just a little more than a week away. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. I'm Karen Drew, Local 4 Defenders. We're taking you behind the scenes of SWAT training. No one did anything until Channel 4 started nosing around. He is going to be surprised when we show up. Sean Light, Local 4 Defenders. She and her grandson inside her home when someone fired a shot. This video from inside that facility. He's not coming out to face Nikki, to face the defenders, to face serious thoughts. Investigative reporting has never been so important. Hey, how does Apartments.com have the most listings? That's well, because we're willing to scout them out no matter how far away. Kevin, anything to report? Nothing. Yeah, that's interesting. Exactly like the last 983 days. Hey, can I come home? Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. What a dedicated intern. He's uh, just one of the reasons why more people find their place at Apartments.com than any other website. Sir, we have an incoming call. Send it to voicemail. Done. Apartments.com, the most popular place to find a place. Devices are like doorways that could allow hackers into your home. And like all doors, they're safer when locked. That's why you need Xfinity XFi. With the XFi Gateway, devices connected to your home's Wi-Fi are protected, which helps keep people outside from accessing your passwords, credit cards, and cameras, and people inside from accidentally visiting sites that aren't secure. And if someone tries, we'll let you know. XFi Advanced Security. If it's connected, it's protected. Get Xfinity Internet and ask how to upgrade your in-home Wi-Fi. Switch today. Back to school is on everyone's mind. From policies to student-teacher health and safety concerns to how families are coping, Local 4 and Click on Detroit are committed to covering the education crisis. Monday, summer is still in full swing, but for many, back to school uncertainty is looming. Sparty says there's big changes here at Michigan State, from classroom sizes to academic changes to how the students are actually getting their food in the dining halls. We're going to lay it all out for students and parents. Join us starting Monday at 6 a.m. on Local 4 News Today. Welcome back.
back. I think I said a little more than one week. Check that. A little more than two weeks. Two weeks from this Tuesday, we'll be voting in the August 4th primary in Michigan. Now, the last primary election in our state gave us the night that the governor announced the first two cases of the virus in the state. And here we are now trying to figure out how the impact uh, will be on an election held in the throes of a pandemic. Let's talk about it with uh, Nolan Fenley from the Detroit News. He's up there on the upper right hand part of the screen. Uh, below him, Stephen Henderson from Detroit Today on WDET. And uh, up there on the upper uh, left hand side, political consultant Mario Morrow. Gang, thanks very much for being here. Uh, Stephen, let me start with you. It's interesting. Uh, originally, I was thinking, well, it's a primary and there's very seldom much drama in primaries in Michigan. Well, there's a couple of things that are really <laughs> interesting this time around. Yeah, there are. And some of it is that, uh, at least in Oakland County, you've got this profound shift taking place, right? Uh, this was a county that was Republican for such a long time. Uh, Democrats now probably are the majority there. And uh, you'll have your first likely Democratic Oakland County executive at, in November. But, uh, but you've got, uh, you know, more than one person. Who, who thinks they should represent the Democrats uh, in that seat. So you've got a primary there. Uh, and you've got really interesting challenges to prosecutors, sitting prosecutors in both Oakland and Wayne, uh, something we don't normally see uh, uh, in, in electoral yeah. politics here. Uh, the, usually prosecutors' races don't get all that yeah. heated, but in both of those counties, you have challengers who I think are making very, very interesting and strong cases for themselves. Yeah, we're going to get around uh, to uh, all those races you just mentioned. I want to start, though, Mario, uh, in the 13th congressional seat. Really interesting with Rashida Tlaib. Uh, she emerged from a, a pretty big field of candidates the last time, as we all recall, uh, and now being challenged by uh, Brenda Jones again, who was in that race the last time, though Brenda doesn't have to fight near as many other competitors off this time. Is there any chance Rashida Tlaib loses this seat uh, if after two years of getting an awful lot of national attention in Washington? Well, I don't want to say it's uh, that, that she has a possibility of losing or winning because it's early in the primary and she's a one-term neophyte. However, uh, she's raised a great deal of money um, and she's been working hard, uh, whether you like her politics or don't. Then there's Brenda Jones, who... Uh, for lack of a better terminology, is an incumbent. She was a congressperson for like two yeah. months, maybe three <laughs> months. So That's uh, right. but the difference the difference here is, is that the, the last time the field was splattered with a lot of people in the race and the votes were splintered up. Uh, so now it's 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 gonna come down to if Brenda Jones can deliver that message, if she can uh, raise some money and come out of that primary victorious. Uh, a lot of people uh, have a lot of confidence in her, but yet a lot of people feel that Rashida Tlaib has, you know, as a neophyte, has done a great job um, and has represented the district well. Interesting race there, isn't it, Nolan? It is, and you know, you may find it hard to believe, and I'm sure Representative Tlaib was just as shocked, but we endorsed her in that race, and we did <laughs> yes. so because, uh, you know, she is a passionate, high energy, person who pays attention to her district, uh, we might have taken a look at, at a number of other challengers, but I think um, Brenda Jones just doesn't have the enthusiasm, the energy, or the message to represent this district well, and I think that's why uh, Representative Tlaib will win the primary. Uh, Stephen, before we move on to Oakland County, you think uh, any, any chance you think Tlaib gets beat? I mean, I think there is a chance because of what Mario was talking about. I mean, last time she won because uh, the field was so splintered. Mm. Uh, there, there was a concerted effort this time to to select one candidate uh, and get everybody behind that candidate uh, to challenge her for that seat. There's a lot of people who still believe, uh, even as progressive as Rashida is, that there ought to be an African American sitting in that seat uh, that John Conyers had yeah. for as long as uh, he did. And so some of what's going on is people trying to, to, to assert that again and say, uh, they, they ought to have a shot at uh, giving voters that choice. Yeah, uh, let's move now to, to that seat that uh, Steve was just talking about in Oakland County. Mario, um, for many, many years, uh, unimaginable uh, to many people to see a Democrat as the Oakland County executive, uh, where Brooks Patterson, of course, held that seat for so many years. Uh, not only do we have two really strong candidates vying for that seat right now, it's gotten nasty between the two of them in the ads. Uh, Dave Coulter oh, and Andy Meisner. 
I was very shocked to see that. And, uh, you know, both Andy and Dave are very good people. They're, they've done well. Um, the current, uh, Dave, the current uh, uh, county exec has, as an interim has done a great job. He's Bill Bridges. People are, um, are behind him. Uh, but yet, Andy Meisner has, you know, he's been a treasurer out there for a while. He's been, at one point, the only Democrat in Oakland County, high level, who's had a position uh, of respectability uh, and notoriety, I should say. So this is going to be a huge challenge. Unfortunately, it's come to the point where you've got now uh, two Democrats uh, who are running against each other for a seat that was held by a Republican for a long time. Yeah. And everybody knows that it was Coach Patterson. It's quite a sea change uh, in Oakland County, Nolan. Well, and I, I don't agree with Steve that it's Democratic. A dem, a, whoever wins the Democratic Party is going to win in November. You've got a very strong Republican out there with a good base. And Mike Kowal, former mm -hmm. senator, yep. former state rep, representative, he'll be well-funded. He knows the county. He knows how to campaign. These two guys shredding each other up. Uh, you know, it, it might not be as easy walk in for uh, a Democrat as it might seem. And Stephen, let me. I think, I think, Devin, I think that Nolan makes a good point. However, that tipping point uh, to the Democrats in Oakland County has moved over that 51 percent, and this is a presidential year. Um, you know, we don't know what's mm -hmm. going on in Oakland as it relates to Trump versus Biden, but I will tell you this: uh, the Democrats will be out in huge and large numbers. And I do believe that the Democratic candidate will win that seat in November. I wouldn't bet a dollar, though, of, of somebody else's money right now as to what the political landscape looks like by the time we get to November. I, I'm, I'm absolutely lost on that one. But, Stephen, your thoughts on that uh, executive race? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, the, negative, uh, the negative tone of the campaign so far is a little surprising, although uh, I, I understand that the internal polls show uh, Coulter with a substantial lead, and that leaves Meisner, who should have, uh, who should be in a stronger position. Not a lot of options, right, to make up that ground before before August. And I think that's why you're seeing some of that negative uh, campaigning take hold. Uh, I, I do think the Democrats, uh, unless something unexpected happens, and of course you say that in 2020, and of course something unexpected is going to yeah. happen. Uh, but but I do think the Democrats are in a very strong position to take that yeah. to take that seat. Mike Kowal uh, does not have uh, the, the the countywide base anymore uh, because he's a Republican. That that someone like Meisner or Coulter, who's in the seat now uh, and doing a job that people seem to to appreciate, uh, is going to have. I think there's there's going to be a, a real uphill battle for Republicans to keep that seat. Uh, Nolan, we've got three really interesting prosecutors' races, one in each of the three counties yeah. going on. I'm, I'm curious as to which one uh, has uh, most of your attention. Well, I think that Oakland County race, I, I do think Jessica Cooper is in a lot of trouble. I mean, let's remember what's in the news this week with that young girl who is sitting in the juvenile right. detention center because she didn't do her homework. Right. homework. That is the sort of priority Jessica Cooper has put on her office since she took, I mean, took it. I mean, she, she prosecutes kids for text, sexting, uh, all sorts of uh, misplaced priorities. And Karen McDonald's doing... Uh, as, as the endorsements of a lot of uh, very important folks and organizations out there, and is putting up a, a solid campaign, I think she she should she could do it. Um, I'm interested to see what um, what will happen in Macomb County, where Pete Lacido, who's had some issues with uh, uh, sexual harassment in the yep. legislature, whether he can overcome those and win the Republican primary there. If he does, I think he's got a stiff. Stiff um, challenge. Uh, there are a lot of good Democrats in the field as well, but it'd be interested to see if voters will overlook uh, yeah. that negative publicity. If uh, you will. Mario, I'm starting to run out of time, but uh, in, in Wayne County, uh, Kim Worthy has had that job for a long time. We've got a newcomer in Victoria Burton Harris uh, on the scene. I think she's just 33. Kim Worthy, have anything to worry about? I don't think so. I think Kim Worthy is going to win and probably win in a landslide. Uh, very well liked. Uh, she led the rape kit. Um, you know, trying to figure out what's going on with the rape, rape kit. And remember, based on everything that's going on right now, she was premier as it relates to the Malice Green situation back in the day, police brutality. So mm -hmm. Kim Worthy, I think, will get the nod. Uh, I see you. Do I see you nodding in agreement there, Stephen? 
Yeah, I think it's a tough road for uh, Harris. I talked this week with both Harris and McDonald about their challenges to the sitting prosecutors. What's interesting is both of them are kind of uh, uh, calling on this this wave of protest against uh, aggressive prosecution, uh, police uh, aggression, as the as the, uh, the the message to say that we need change. That could take hold. Uh, I think it could take hold in Oakland easier than in Wayne. But I think Mario's right. I mean, Kim Worthy is one of the most, uh, I think, well-footed uh, yeah. politicians in, a, in, a, in any public office in, in, uh, in Michigan. It would be very hard, I think, to knock her off. Great thoughts on all those races, guys. But, of course, the wild card in all of it is uh, what happens with turnout. How, how do people cast their votes uh, with, as we deal with the virus? <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for, to all three of you. Thanks for being here. We'll wrap things up for Flashpoint right after this. The sun and high heat can fry your car's paint job. But Mako can make it look like it never happened. Act now with our paint sales starting at $4.99. Uh-oh, better get Mako. There's a reason we have more cars, more brands, and more selection than any other dealer in Michigan. The reason is you. With 43 Michigan locations and 34 different brands, the Suburban Collection has more ways to make your purchase, service, and overall automotive experience the best in Michigan. From your first car to your dream car, and everything in between. Go to drivesuburban.com and get your car today. The insurance companies hate us because the Mike Morse Law Firm wins more money than any other law firm in Michigan. They take aim, but they miss. Missed. My competitors, none of them like me. Because more people call the Mike Morse Law Firm for accident cases. They take aim, but they miss. Closer. Hurt in an accident? Call me. Let's go for the win. The sun and high heat can fry your car's paint job. But Mako can make it look like it never happened. Act now with our paint sales starting at $4.99. Uh-oh, better get Mako. Local news is more important than ever. Get the very latest on developments in Metro Detroit on Local 4 News First at 4, then on Inside Edition. Toxic rivers for puppies. Why did this pooch die after going for a swim in a national park? She grabbed onto it and I was like, oh no. What's in the water that could kill your dog? Then, why are lingerie sales going through the roof? women spicing up their lives during the pandemic. Inside Edition, following Local 4 News, first at 4, Monday. And we're all out of time. My thanks to my guests for being here, but most of all, my thanks to you. Have a great week, stay safe, and we'll see you next time back here for Flashpoint.